I, Paul, have been called and sent by Jesus, the Messiah, according to God's plan, along with my friend Sosthenes. I send this letter to you in God's church at Corinth, believers cleaned up by Jesus and set apart for a God-filled life. I include in my greeting all who call out to Jesus, wherever they live. He's their master as well as ours. May all the gifts and benefits that come from God our Father, and the Master, Jesus Christ, be yours. Every time I think of you, and I think of you often, I thank God for your lives of free and open access to God, given by Jesus. There's no end to what has happened in you, it's beyond speech, beyond knowledge. The evidence of Christ has been clearly verified in your lives. Just think, you don't need a thing, you've got it all. All God's gifts are right in front of you as you wait expectantly for our Master Jesus to arrive on the scene for the finale. And not only that, but God Himself is right alongside to keep you steady and on track until things are all wrapped up by Jesus. God, who got you started in this spiritual adventure, shares with us the life of His Son and our Master Jesus. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. I have a serious concern to bring up with you, my friends, using the authority of Jesus, our Master. I'll put it as urgently as I can, you must get along with each other. You must learn to be considerate of one another, cultivating a life in common. I bring this up because some from Chloe's family brought a most disturbing report to my attention, that you're fighting among yourselves. I'll tell you exactly what I was told, you're all picking sides, going around saying, I'm on Paul's side, or I'm for Apollos, or Peter is my man, or I'm in the Messiah group. I ask you, has the Messiah been chopped up in little pieces so we can each have a relic all our own? Was Paul crucified for you? Was a single one of you baptized in Paul's name? I was not involved with any of your baptisms, except for Crispus and Gaius, and on getting this report, I'm sure glad I wasn't. At least no one can go around saying he was baptized in my name. Come to think of it, I also baptized Stephanas' family, but as far as I can recall, that's it. God didn't send me out to collect a following for myself, but to preach the message of what He has done, collecting a following for Him. And He didn't send me to do it with a lot of fancy rhetoric of my own, lest the powerful action at the center, Christ on the cross, be trivialized into mere words. The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hellbent on destruction, but for those on the way of salvation it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully as it turns out. It's written, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose so-called experts as shams.so where can you find someone truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent in this day and age? Hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? Since the world and all its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God, God in His wisdom took delight in using what the world considered stupid, preaching, of all things, to bring those who trust Him into the way of salvation. While Jews clamor for miraculous demonstrations and Greeks go in for philosophical wisdom, we go right on proclaiming Christ, the Crucified. Jews treat this like an anti-miracle, and Greeks pass it off as absurd. But to us who are personally called by God Himself, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's ultimate miracle and wisdom all wrapped up in one. Human wisdom is so cheap, so impotent, next to the seeming absurdity of God. Human strength can't begin to compete with God's weakness. Take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you, not many influential, 
not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses, chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies? That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start, comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. You'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's sheer genius, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I deliberately kept it plain and simple, first Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did, Jesus crucified. I was unsure of how to go about this, and felt totally inadequate, I was scared to death, if you want the truth of it, and so nothing I said could have impressed you or anyone else. But the message came through anyway. God's Spirit and God's power did it, which made it clear that your life of faith is a response to God's power, not to some fancy mental or emotional footwork by me or anyone else. We, of course, have plenty of wisdom to pass on to you once you get your feet on firm spiritual ground, but it's not popular wisdom, the fashionable wisdom of high-priced experts that will be out of date in a year or so. God's wisdom is something mysterious that goes deep into the interior of His purposes. You don't find it lying around on the surface. It's not the latest message, but more like the oldest, what God determined as the way to bring out His best in us, long before we ever arrived on the scene. The experts of our day haven't a clue about what this eternal plan is. If they had, they wouldn't have killed the master of the God-designed life on a cross. That's why we have this scripture text, no one's ever seen or heard anything like this. Never so much as imagined anything quite like it. What God has arranged for those who love him, but you've seen and heard it because God by His Spirit has brought it all out into the open before you. The Spirit, not content to flit around on the surface, dives into the depths of God, and brings out what God planned all along. Whoever knows what you're thinking and planning except you yourself. The same with God, except that He not only knows what He's thinking, but He lets us in on it. God offers a full report on the gifts of life and salvation that He is giving us. We don't have to rely on the world's guesses and opinions. We didn't learn this by reading books or going to school, we learned it from God, who taught us person to person through Jesus, and we're passing it on to you in the same first-hand, personal way. The unspiritual self, just as it is by nature, can't receive the gifts of God's Spirit. There's no capacity for them. They seem like so much silliness. Spirit can be known only by spirit, God's spirit and our spirits in open communion. Spiritually alive, we have access to everything God's spirit is doing, and can't be judged by unspiritual critics. Isaiah's question, is there anyone around who knows God's spirit, anyone who knows what he is doing, has been answered, Christ knows, and we have Christ's Spirit. But for right now, friends, I'm completely frustrated by your unspiritual dealings with each other and with God. You're acting like infants in relation to Christ, capable of nothing much more than nursing at the breast. Well, then, I'll nurse you since you don't seem capable of anything more. As long as you grab for what makes you feel good or makes you look important, are you really much different than a babe at the breast, content only when everything's going your way? When one of you says, I'm on Paul's side, and another says, I'm for Apollos, aren't you being totally childish? Who do you think Paul is, anyway? Or Apollos, for that matter? Servants, both of us, 
servants who waited on you as you gradually learned to entrust your lives to our mutual master. We each carried out our servant assignment. I planted the seed, Apollos watered the plants, but God made you grow. It's not the one who plants or the one who waters who is at the center of this process but God, who makes things grow. Planting and watering are menial servant jobs at minimum wages. What makes them worth doing is the God we are serving. You happen to be God's field in which we are working. Or, to put it another way, you are God's house. Using the gift God gave me as a good architect, I designed blueprints, Apollos is putting up the walls. Let each carpenter who comes on the job take care to build on the foundation. Remember, there is only one foundation, the one already laid, Jesus Christ. Take particular care in picking out your building materials. Eventually there is going to be an inspection. If you use cheap or inferior materials, you'll be found out. The inspection will be thorough and rigorous. You won't get by with a thing. If your work passes inspection, fine, if it doesn't, your part of the building will be torn out and started over. But you won't be torn out, you'll survive, but just barely. You realize, don't you, that you are the temple of God, and God himself is present in you. No one will get by with vandalizing God's temple, you can be sure of that. God's temple is sacred, and you, remember, are the temple. Don't fool yourself. Don't think that you can be wise merely by being relevant. Be God's fool, that's the path to true wisdom. What the world calls smart, God calls stupid. It's written in scripture, he exposes the hype of the hipsters. The master sees through the smoke screens. Of the know-it-alls. I don't want to hear any of you bragging about yourself or anyone else. Everything is already yours as a gift, Paul, Apollos, Peter, the world, life, death, the present, the future, all of it is yours, and you are privileged to be in union with Christ, who is in union with God. Don't imagine us leaders to be something we aren't. We are servants of Christ, not his masters. We are guides into God's divine secrets, not security guards posted to protect them. The requirements for a good guide are reliability and accurate knowledge. It matters very little to me what you think of me, even less where I rank in popular opinion. I don't even rank myself. Comparisons in these matters are pointless. I'm not aware of anything that would disqualify me from being a good guide for you, but that doesn't mean much. The master makes that judgment. So don't get ahead of the master and jump to conclusions with your judgments before all the evidence is in. When he comes, he will bring out in the open and place in evidence all kinds of things we never even dreamed of, inner motives and purposes and prayers. Only then will any one of us get to hear the, well done, of God. All I'm doing right now, friends, is showing how these things pertain to Apollos and me so that you will learn restraint and not rush into making judgments without knowing all the facts. It's important to look at things from God's point of view. I would rather not see you inflating or deflating reputations based on mere hearsay. For who do you know that really knows you, knows your heart? And even if they did, is there anything they would discover in you that you could take credit for? Isn't everything you have and everything you are sheer gifts from God? So what's the point of all this comparing and competing? You already have all you need. You already have more access to God than you can handle. Without bringing either Apollos or me into it, you're sitting on top of the world, at least God's world, and we're right there, sitting alongside you. 
It seems to me that God has put us who bear his message on stage in a theater in which no one wants to buy a ticket. We're something everyone stands around and stares at, like an accident in the street. We're the Messiah's misfits. You might be sure of yourselves, but we live in the midst of frailties and uncertainties. You might be well thought of by others, but we're mostly kicked around. Much of the time we don't have enough to eat, we wear patched and threadbare clothes, we get doors slammed in our faces, and we pick up odd jobs anywhere we can to eke out a living. When they call us names, we say, God bless you. When they spread rumors about us, we put in a good word for them. We're treated like garbage, the leftovers that nobody wants. And it's not getting any better. I'm not writing all this as a neighborhood scold to shame you. I'm writing as a father to you, my children. I love you and want you to grow up well, not spoiled. There are a lot of people around who can't wait to tell you what you've done wrong, but there aren't many fathers willing to take the time and effort to help you grow up. It was as Jesus helped me proclaim God's message to you that I became your father. I'm not, you know, asking you to do anything I'm not already doing myself. This is why I sent Timothy to you earlier. He is also my dear son, and true to the Master. He will refresh your memory on the instructions I regularly give all the churches on the way of Christ. I know there are some among you who are so full of themselves they never listen to anyone, let alone me. They don't think I'll ever show up in person. But I'll be there sooner than you think, God willing, and then we'll see if they're full of anything but hot air. God's way is not a matter of mere talk, it's an empowered life. So how should I prepare to come to you? As a severe disciplinarian who makes you walk the line? Or as a good friend and counselor who wants to share heart to heart with you? You decide. I also received a report of scandalous sex within your church family, a kind that wouldn't be tolerated even outside the church, one of your men is sleeping with his stepmother. And you're so above it all that it doesn't even faze you. Shouldn't this break your hearts? Shouldn't it bring you to your knees in tears? Shouldn't this person and his conduct be confronted and dealt with? I'll tell you what I would do. Even though I'm not there in person, consider me right there with you, because I can fully see what's going on. I'm telling you that this is wrong. You must not simply look the other way and hope it goes away on its own. Bring it out in the open and deal with it in the authority of Jesus our Master. Assemble the community. I'll be present in spirit with you and our Master Jesus will be present in power. Hold this man's conduct up to public scrutiny. Let him defend it if he can. But if he can't, then out with him. It will be totally devastating to him, of course, and embarrassing to you. But better devastation and embarrassment than damnation. You want him on his feet and forgiven before the Master on the Day of Judgment. Your flip and callous arrogance in these things bothers me. You pass it off as a small thing, but it's anything but that. Yeast, too, is a small thing, but it works its way through a whole batch of bread dough pretty fast. So get rid of this yeast. Our true identity is flat and plain, not puffed up with the wrong kind of ingredient. The Messiah, our Passover lamb, has already been sacrificed for the Passover meal, and we are the unraised bread part of the feast. So let's live out our part in the feast, not as raised bread swollen with the yeast of evil, but as flat bread, simple, genuine, unpretentious. I wrote you in my earlier letter that you shouldn't make yourselves at home among the sexually promiscuous. I didn't mean that you should have nothing at all to do with outsiders of that sort. Or with criminals, whether blue or white collar. 
or with spiritual phonies, for that matter. You'd have to leave the world entirely to do that. But I am saying that you shouldn't act as if everything is just fine when a friend who claims to be a Christian is promiscuous or crooked, is flip with God or rude to friends, gets drunk or becomes greedy and predatory. You can't just go along with this, treating it as acceptable behavior. I'm not responsible for what the outsiders do, but don't we have some responsibility for those within our community of believers? God decides on the outsiders, but we need to decide when our brothers and sisters are out of line and, if necessary, clean house. And how dare you take each other to court? When you think you have been wronged, does it make any sense to go before a court that knows nothing of God's ways instead of a family of Christians? The day is coming when the world is going to stand before a jury made up of followers of Jesus. If someday you are going to rule on the world's fate, wouldn't it be a good idea to practice on some of these smaller cases? Why, we're even going to judge angels. So why not these everyday affairs? As these disagreements and wrongs surface, why would you ever entrust them to the judgment of people you don't trust in any other way? I say this as bluntly as I can to wake you up to the stupidity of what you're doing. Is it possible that there isn't one level-headed person among you who can make fair decisions when disagreements and disputes come up? I don't believe it. And here you are taking each other to court before people who don't even believe in God. How can they render justice if they don't believe in the God of justice? These court cases are a black eye on your community. Wouldn't it be far better to just take it? to let yourselves be wronged and forget it? All you're doing is providing fuel for more wrong, more injustice, bringing more hurt to the people of your own spiritual family. Don't you realize that this is not the way to live? Unjust people who don't care about God will not be joining in His kingdom. Those who use and abuse each other, use and abuse sex, use and abuse the earth and everything in it, don't qualify as citizens in God's kingdom. A number of you know from experience what I'm talking about, for not so long ago you were on that list. Since then, you've been cleaned up and given a fresh start by Jesus, our Master, our Messiah, and by our God present in us, the Spirit. Just because something is technically legal doesn't mean that it's spiritually appropriate. If I went around doing whatever I thought I could get by with, I'd be a slave to my whims. You know the old saying, first you eat to live, and then you live to eat. Well, it may be true that the body is only a temporary thing, but that's no excuse for stuffing your body with food, or indulging it with sex. Since the Master honors you with a body, honor him with your body. God honored the Master's body by raising it from the grave. He'll treat yours with the same resurrection power. Until that time, remember that your bodies are created with the same dignity as the Master's body. You wouldn't take the Master's body off to a whorehouse, would you? I should hope not. There's more to sex than mere skin on skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. As written in scripture, the two become one. Since we want to become spiritually one with the Master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely than ever, the kind of sex that can never become one. There is a sense in which sexual sins are different from all others. In sexual sin we violate the sacredness of our own bodies, these bodies that were made for God-given and God-modeled love, for becoming one with another. Or didn't you realize that your body is a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit? Don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you. 
God owns the whole works. So let people see God in and through your body. Now, getting down to the questions you asked in your letter to me. First, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly, but only within a certain context. It's good for a man to have a wife, and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality, the husband seeking to satisfy his wife, the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. Abstaining from sex is permissible for a period of time if you both agree to it, and if it's for the purposes of prayer and fasting, but only for such times. Then come back together again. Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. I'm not, understand, commanding these periods of abstinence, only providing my best counsel if you should choose them. Sometimes I wish everyone were single like me, a simpler life in many ways. But celibacy is not for everyone any more than marriage is. God gives the gift of the single life to some, the gift of the married life to others. I do, though, tell the unmarried and widows that singleness might well be the best thing for them, as it has been for me. But if they can't manage their desires and emotions, they should by all means go ahead and get married. The difficulties of marriage are preferable by far to a sexually tortured life as a single. And if you are married, stay married. This is the master's command, not mine. If a wife should leave her husband, she must either remain single or else come back and make things right with him. And the husband has no right to get rid of his wife. For the rest of you who are in mixed marriages, Christian married to non-Christian, we have no explicit command from the master. So this is what you must do. If you are a man with a wife who is not a believer but who still wants to live with you, hold on to her. If you are a woman with a husband who is not a believer but he wants to live with you, hold on to him. The unbelieving husband shares to an extent in the holiness of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is likewise touched by the holiness of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be left out, as it is, they also are included in the spiritual purposes of God. On the other hand, if the unbelieving spouse walks out, you've got to let him or her go. You don't have to hold on desperately. God has called us to make the best of it, as peacefully as we can. You never know, wife, the way you handle this might bring your husband not only back to you but to God. You never know, husband, the way you handle this might bring your wife not only back to you but to God. And don't be wishing you were someplace else or with someone else. Where you are right now is God's place for you. Live and obey and love and believe right there. God, not your marital status, defines your life. Don't think I'm being harder on you than on the others. I give this same counsel in all the churches. Were you Jewish at the time God called you? Don't try to remove the evidence. Were you non-Jewish at the time of your call? Don't become a Jew. Being Jewish isn't the point. The really important thing is obeying God's call, following His commands. Stay where you were when God called your name. Were you a slave? Slavery is no roadblock to obeying and believing. I don't mean you're stuck and can't leave. If you have a chance at freedom, go ahead and take it. I'm simply trying to point out that under your new master you're going to experience a marvelous freedom you would never have dreamed of. On the other hand, if you were free when Christ called you, 
you'll experience a delightful enslavement to God you would never have dreamed of. All of you, slave and free both, were once held hostage in a sinful society. Then a huge sum was paid out for your ransom. So please don't, out of old habit, slip back into being or doing what everyone else tells you. Friends, stay where you were called to be. God is there. Hold the high ground with Him at your side. The Master did not give explicit direction regarding virgins, but as one much experienced in the mercy of the Master and loyal to Him all the way, you can trust my counsel. Because of the current pressures on us from all sides, I think it would probably be best to stay just as you are. Are you married? Stay married. Are you unmarried? Don't get married. But there's certainly no sin in getting married, whether you're a virgin or not. All I am saying is that when you marry, you take on additional stress in an already stressful time, and I want to spare you if possible. I do want to point out, friends, that time is of the essence. There is no time to waste, so don't complicate your lives unnecessarily. Keep it simple, in marriage, grief, joy, whatever. Even in ordinary things, your daily routines of shopping, and so on. Deal as sparingly as possible with the things the world thrusts on you. This world as you see it is fading away. I want you to live as free of complications as possible. When you're unmarried, you're free to concentrate on simply pleasing the master. Marriage involves you in all the nuts and bolts of domestic life and in wanting to please your spouse, leading to so many more demands on your attention. The time and energy that married people spend on caring for and nurturing each other, the unmarried can spend in becoming whole and holy instruments of God. I'm trying to be helpful and make it as easy as possible for you, not make things harder. All I want is for you to be able to develop a way of life in which you can spend plenty of time together with the master without a lot of distractions. If a man has a woman friend to whom he is loyal but never intended to marry, having decided to serve God as a single, and then changes his mind, deciding he should marry her, he should go ahead and marry. It's no sin, it's not even a step down from celibacy, as some say. On the other hand, if a man is comfortable in his decision for a single life in service to God and it's entirely his own conviction and not imposed on him by others, he ought to stick with it. Marriage is spiritually and morally right and not inferior to singleness in any way, although as I indicated earlier, because of the times we live in, I do have pastoral reasons for encouraging singleness. A wife must stay with her husband as long as he lives. If he dies, she is free to marry anyone she chooses. She will, of course, want to marry a believer and have the blessing of the master. By now you know that I think she'll be better off staying single. The master, in my opinion, thinks so, too. The question keeps coming up regarding meat that has been offered up to an idol, should you attend meals where such meat is served, or not? We sometimes tend to think we know all we need to know to answer these kinds of questions, but sometimes our humble hearts can help us more than our proud minds. We never really know enough until we recognize that God alone knows it all. Some people say, quite rightly, that idols have no actual existence, that there's nothing to them, that there is no God other than our one God, that no matter how many of these so-called gods are named and worshipped they still don't add up to anything but a tall story. They say, again, quite rightly, that there is only one God the Father, that everything comes from Him, and that He wants us to live for Him. Also, they say that there is only one Master, Jesus the Messiah, and that everything is for His sake, including us. Yes. It's true. 
In strict logic, then, nothing happened to the meat when it was offered up to an idol. It's just like any other meat. I know that, and you know that. But knowing isn't everything. If it becomes everything, some people end up as know-it-alls who treat others as know-nothings. Real knowledge isn't that insensitive. We need to be sensitive to the fact that we're not all at the same level of understanding in this. Some of you have spent your entire lives eating idle meat, and are sure that there's something bad in the meat that then becomes something bad inside of you. An imagination and conscience shaped under those conditions isn't going to change overnight. But fortunately God doesn't grade us on our diet. We're neither commended when we clean our plate nor reprimanded when we just can't stomach it. But God does care when you use your freedom carelessly in a way that leads a fellow believer still vulnerable to those old associations to be thrown off track. For instance, say you flaunt your freedom by going to a banquet thrown in honor of idols, where the main course is meat sacrificed to idols. Isn't there great danger if someone still struggling over this issue, someone who looks up to you as knowledgeable and mature, sees you go into that banquet? The danger is that he will become terribly confused, maybe even to the point of getting mixed up himself in what his conscience tells him is wrong. Christ gave up his life for that person. Wouldn't you at least be willing to give up going to dinner for him, because, as you say, it doesn't really make any difference. But it does make a difference if you hurt your friend terribly, risking his eternal ruin. When you hurt your friend, you hurt Christ. A free meal here and there isn't worth it at the cost of even one of these weak ones. So, never go to these idle tainted meals if there's any chance it will trip up one of your brothers or sisters. And don't tell me that I have no authority to write like this. I'm perfectly free to do this, isn't that obvious? Haven't I been given a job to do? Wasn't I commissioned to this work in a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus, our Master? Aren't you yourselves proof of the good work that I've done for the Master? Even if no one else admits the authority of my commission, you can't deny it. Why? My work with you is living proof of my authority. I'm not shy in standing up to my critics. We who are on missionary assignments for God have a right to decent accommodations, and we have a right to support for us and our families. You don't seem to have raised questions with the other apostles and our master's brothers and Peter in these matters. So, why me? Is it just Barnabas and I who have to go it alone and pay our own way? Are soldiers self-employed? Are gardeners forbidden to eat vegetables from their own gardens? Don't dairy farmers get to drink their fill from the pail? I'm not just sounding off because I'm irritated. This is all written in the scriptural law. Moses wrote, don't muzzle an ox to keep it from eating the grain when it's threshing. Do you think Moses' primary concern was the care of farm animals? Don't you think his concern extends to us? Of course. Farmers plow and thresh expecting something when the crop comes in. So if we have planted spiritual seed among you, is it out of line to expect a meal or two from you? Others demand plenty from you in these ways. Don't we who have never demanded deserve even more? But we're not going to start demanding now what we've always had a perfect right to. Our decision all along has been to put up with anything rather than to get in the way or detract from the message of Christ. All I'm concerned with right now is that you not use our decision to take advantage of others, depriving them of what is rightly theirs. You know, don't you, that it's always been taken for granted that those who work in the temple live off the proceeds of the temple, and that those who offer sacrifices at the altar eat their meals from what has been sacrificed. Along the same lines, 
the master directed that those who spread the message be supported by those who believe the message. Still, I want it made clear that I've never gotten anything out of this for myself, and that I'm not writing now to get something. I'd rather die than give anyone ammunition to discredit me or question my motives. If I proclaim the message, it's not to get something out of it for myself. I'm compelled to do it, and doomed if I don't. If this was my own idea of just another way to make a living, I'd expect some pay. But since it's not my idea but something solemnly entrusted to me, why would I expect to get paid? So am I getting anything out of it? Yes, as a matter of fact, the pleasure of proclaiming the message at no cost to you. You don't even have to pay my expenses. Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose-living immoralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it, I wanted to be in on it. You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs, one wins. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No lazy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it and then missing out myself. Remember our history, friends, and be warned. All our ancestors were led by the providential cloud and taken miraculously through the sea. They went through the waters, in a baptism like ours, as Moses led them from enslaving death to salvation life. They all ate and drank identical food and drink, meals provided daily by God. They drank from the rock, God's fountain for them that stayed with them wherever they were. And the rock was Christ. But just experiencing God's wonder and grace didn't seem to mean much, most of them were defeated by temptation during the hard times in the desert, and God was not pleased. The same thing could happen to us. We must be on guard so that we never get caught up in wanting our own way as they did. And we must not turn our religion into a circus as they did, first the people partied, then they threw a dance. We must not be sexually promiscuous, they paid for that, remember, with 23,000 deaths in one day. We must never try to get Christ to serve us instead of us serving him, they tried it, and God launched an epidemic of poisonous snakes. We must be careful not to stir up discontent, discontent destroyed them. These are all warning markers, danger, in our history books, written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel, they at the beginning, we at the end, and we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence, it's useless. Cultivate God-confidence. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down, He'll never let you be pushed past your limit, He'll always be there to help you come through it. So, my very dear friends, when you see people reducing God to something they can use or control, get out of their company as fast as you can. 
I assume I'm addressing believers now who are mature. Draw your own conclusions, when we drink the cup of blessing, aren't we taking into ourselves the blood, the very life, of Christ? And isn't it the same with the loaf of bread we break and eat? Don't we take into ourselves the body, the very life, of Christ? Because there is one loaf, our manyness becomes oneness, Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in Him. We don't reduce Christ to what we are, He raises us to what He is. That's basically what happened even in old Israel, those who ate the sacrifices offered on God's altar entered into God's action at the altar. Do you see the difference? Sacrifices offered to idols are offered to nothing, for what's the idol but a nothing? Or worse than nothing, a minus, a demon. I don't want you to become part of something that reduces you to less than yourself. And you can't have it both ways, banqueting with the master one day and slumming with demons the next. Besides, the master won't put up with it. He wants us, all or nothing. Do you think you can get off with anything less? Looking at it one way, you could say, anything goes. Because of God's immense generosity and grace, we don't have to dissect and scrutinize every action to see if it will pass muster. But the point is not to just get by. We want to live well, but our foremost efforts should be to help others live well. With that as a base to work from, common sense can take you the rest of the way. Eat anything sold at the butcher shop, for instance, you don't have to run an idolatry test on every item. The earth, after all, is God's and everything in it. That everything certainly includes the leg of lamb in the butcher shop. If a non-believer invites you to dinner and you feel like going, go ahead and enjoy yourself, eat everything placed before you. It would be both bad manners and bad spirituality to cross-examine your host on the ethical purity of each course as it is served. On the other hand, if he goes out of his way to tell you that this or that was sacrificed to God or God is so and so, you should pass. Even though you may be indifferent as to where it came from, he isn't, and you don't want to send mixed messages to him about who you are worshipping. But, except for these special cases, I'm not going to walk around on eggshells worrying about what small-minded people might say, I'm going to stride free and easy, knowing what our large-minded master has already said. If I eat what is served to me, grateful to God for what is on the table, how can I worry about what someone will say? I thanked God for it and he blessed it. So eat your meals heartily, not worrying about what others say about you, you're eating to God's glory, after all, not to please them. As a matter of fact, do everything that way, heartily and freely to God's glory. At the same time, don't be callous in your exercise of freedom, thoughtlessly stepping on the toes of those who aren't as free as you are. I try my best to be considerate of everyone's feelings in all these matters, I hope you will be, too. It pleases me that you continue to remember and honor me by keeping up the traditions of the faith I taught you. All actual authority stems from Christ. In a marriage relationship, there is authority from Christ to husband, and from husband to wife. The authority of Christ is the authority of God. Any man who speaks with God or about God in a way that shows a lack of respect for the authority of Christ, dishonors Christ. In the same way, a wife who speaks with God in a way that shows a lack of respect for the authority of her husband, dishonors her husband. Worse, she dishonors herself, an ugly sight, like a woman with her head shaved. This is basically the origin of these customs we have of women wearing head coverings in worship, while men take their hats off. By these symbolic acts, men and women, who far too often but heads with each other, 
submit their heads to the head, God. Don't, by the way, read too much into the differences here between men and women. Neither man nor woman can go it alone or claim priority. Man was created first, as a beautiful shining reflection of God, that is true. But the head on a woman's body clearly outshines in beauty the head of her, head, her husband. The first woman came from man, true, but ever since then, every man comes from a woman. And since virtually everything comes from God anyway, let's quit going through these, whose first, routines. Don't you agree there is something naturally powerful in the symbolism, a woman, her beautiful hair reminiscent of angels, praying in adoration, a man, his head bared in reverence, praying in submission. I hope you're not going to be argumentative about this. All God's churches see it this way, I don't want you standing out as an exception. Regarding this next item, I'm not at all pleased. I am getting the picture that when you meet together it brings out your worst side instead of your best. First, I get this report on your divisiveness, competing with and criticizing each other. I'm reluctant to believe it, but there it is. The best that can be said for it is that the testing process will bring truth into the open and confirm it. And then I find that you bring your divisions to worship, you come together, and instead of eating the Lord's Supper, you bring in a lot of food from the outside and make pigs of yourselves. Some are left out, and go home hungry. Others have to be carried out, too drunk to walk. I can't believe it. Don't you have your own homes to eat and drink in? Why would you stoop to desecrating God's church? Why would you actually shame God's poor? I never would have believed you would stoop to this. And I'm not going to stand by and say nothing. Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is so centrally important. I received my instructions from the Master himself and passed them on to you. The Master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me, after supper, he did the same thing with the cup, This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me, what you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the Master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the Master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. Anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be part of? Examine your motives, test your heart, come to this meal in holy awe. If you give no thought, or worse, don't care, about the broken body of the Master when you eat and drink, you're running the risk of serious consequences. That's why so many of you even now are listless and sick, and others have gone to an early grave. If we get this straight now, we won't have to be straightened out later on. Better to be confronted by the Master now than to face a fiery confrontation later. So, my friends, when you come together to the Lord's table, be reverent and courteous with one another. If you're so hungry that you can't wait to be served, go home and get a sandwich. But by no means risk turning this meal into an eating and drinking binge or a family squabble. It is a spiritual meal, a love feast, the other things you asked about, I'll respond to in person when I make my next visit. What I want to talk about now is the various ways God's Spirit gets worked into our lives. This is complex and often misunderstood, but I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Remember how you were when you didn't know God, led from one phony God to another, never knowing what you were doing, 
just doing it because everybody else did it. It's different in this life. God wants us to use our intelligence, to seek to understand as well as we can. For instance, by using your heads, you know perfectly well that the Spirit of God would never prompt anyone to say, Jesus be damned. Nor would anyone be inclined to say, Jesus is Master, without the insight of the Holy Spirit. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God Himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is, everyone gets in on it, everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit, and to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful, wise counsel clear understanding simple trust healing the sick miraculous acts proclamation distinguishing between spirits tongues interpretation of tongues all these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out one by one by the one Spirit of God. He decides who gets what, and when. You can easily enough see how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ. By means of His one Spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. We each used to independently call our own shots, but then we entered into a large and integrated life in which He has the final say in everything. This is what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized. Each of us is now a part of his resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at one fountain, his spirit, where we all come to drink. The old labels we once used to identify ourselves, labels like Jew or Greek, slave or free, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If foot said, I'm not elegant like hand, embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body, would that make it so? If ear said, I'm not beautiful like I, transparent and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head, would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where He wanted it. But I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body, but a monster. What we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. Can you imagine I telling hand, get lost, I don't need you? Or, head telling foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice it works the other way, the lower, the part, the more basic, and therefore necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's a part of your own body you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is, without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to full-bodied hair? The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church, every part dependent on every other part, the parts we mention and the parts we don't, the parts we see and the parts we don't. 
If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt, and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. You are Christ's body, that's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything. You're familiar with some of the parts that God has formed in His church, which is His body, apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, helpers, organizers, those who pray in tongues, but it's obvious by now, isn't it, that Christ's church is a complete body and not a gigantic, unidimensional part. It's not all apostle, not all prophet, not all miracle worker, not all healer, not all prayer in tongues, not all interpreter of tongues. And yet some of you keep competing for so-called important parts, but now I want to lay out a far better way for you. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church, every part dependent on every other part, the parts we mention and the parts we don't, the parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. You are Christ's body, that's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything. You're familiar with some of the parts that God has formed in His church, which is His body, apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, helpers, organizers, those who pray in tongues, but it's obvious by now, isn't it, that Christ's church is a complete body and not a gigantic, unidimensional part. It's not all apostle, not all prophet, not all miracle worker, not all healer, not all prayer in tongues, not all interpreter of tongues. And yet some of you keep competing for so-called important parts, but now I want to lay out a far better way for you. Go after a life of love as if your life depended on it, because it does. Give yourselves to the gifts God gives you. Most of all, try to proclaim His truth. If you praise Him in the private language of tongues, God understands you but no one else does, for you are sharing intimacies just between you and Him. But when you proclaim His truth in everyday speech, you're letting others in on the truth so that they can grow and be strong and experience His presence with you. The one who prays using a private, prayer language certainly gets a lot out of it, but proclaiming God's truth to the church in its common language brings the whole church into growth and strength. I want all of you to develop intimacies with God in prayer, but please don't stop with that. Go on and proclaim His clear truth to others. It's more important that everyone have access to the knowledge and love of God in language everyone understands than that you go off and cultivate God's presence in a mysterious prayer language, unless, of course, there is someone who can interpret what you are saying for the benefit of all. Think, friends, if I come to you and all I do is pray privately to God in a way only He can understand, what are you going to get out of that? If I don't address you plainly with some insight or truth or proclamation or teaching, what help am I to you? If musical instruments, flutes, say, or harps, aren't played so that each note is distinct and in tune, how will anyone be able to catch the melody and enjoy the music? If the trumpet call can't be distinguished, will anyone show up for the battle? So if you speak in a way no one can understand, what's the point of opening your mouth? There are many languages in the world and they all mean something to someone. But if I don't understand the language, it's not going to do me much good. It's no different with you. Since you're so eager to participate in what God is doing, why don't you concentrate on doing what helps everyone in the church? So, when you pray in your private prayer language, don't hoard the experience for yourself. Pray for the insight and ability to bring others into that intimacy. 
If I pray in tongues, my spirit prays but my mind lies fallow, and all that intelligence is wasted. So what's the solution? The answer is simple enough. Do both. I should be spiritually free and expressive as I pray, but I should also be thoughtful and mindful as I pray. I should sing with my spirit, and sing with my mind. If you give a blessing using your private prayer language, which no one else understands, how can some outsider who has just shown up and has no idea what's going on know when to say, Amen? Your blessing might be beautiful, but you have very effectively cut that person out of it. I'm grateful to God for the gift of praying in tongues that He gives us for praising Him, which leads to wonderful intimacies we enjoy with Him. I enter into this as much or more than any of you. But when I'm in a church assembled for worship, I'd rather say five words that everyone can understand and learn from than say ten thousand that sound to others like gibberish. To be perfectly frank, I'm getting exasperated with your childish thinking. How long before you grow up and use your head, your adult head? It's all right to have a childlike unfamiliarity with evil, a simple no is all that's needed there. But there's far more to saying yes to something. Only mature and well-exercised intelligence can save you from falling into gullibility. It's written in scripture that God said, in strange tongues. And from the mouths of strangers. I will preach to this people. But they'll neither listen nor believe. So where does it get you, all this speaking in tongues no one understands? It doesn't help believers, and it only gives unbelievers something to gawk at. Plain truth speaking, on the other hand, goes straight to the heart of believers and doesn't get in the way of unbelievers. If you come together as a congregation and some unbelieving outsiders walk in on you as you're all praying in tongues, unintelligible to each other and to them, won't they assume you've taken leave of your senses and get out of there as fast as they can? But if some unbelieving outsiders walk in on a service where people are speaking out God's truth, the plain words will bring them up against the truth and probe their hearts. Before you know it, they're going to be on their faces before God, recognizing that God is among you. So here's what I want you to do. When you gather for worship, each one of you be prepared with something that will be useful for all, sing a hymn, teach a lesson, tell a story, lead a prayer, provide an insight. If prayers are offered in tongues, two or three's the limit, and then only if someone is present who can interpret what you're saying. Otherwise, keep it between God and yourself. And no more than two or three speakers at a meeting, with the rest of you listening and taking it to heart. Take your turn, no one person taking over. Then each speaker gets a chance to say something special from God, and you all learn from each other. If you choose to speak, you're also responsible for how and when you speak. When we worship the right way, God doesn't stir us up into confusion, He brings us into harmony. This goes for all the churches, no exceptions. Wives must not disrupt worship, talking when they should be listening, asking questions that could more appropriately be asked of their husbands at home. God's Book of the Law guides our manners and customs here. Wives have no license to use the time of worship for unwarranted speaking. Do you, both women and men, imagine that you're a sacred oracle determining what's right and wrong? Do you think everything revolves around you? If any one of you thinks God has something for you to say or has inspired you to do something, pay close attention to what I have written. This is the way the Master wants it. If you won't play by these rules, God can't use you. Sorry. Three things, then, to sum this up, when you speak forth God's truth, speak your heart out. Don't tell people how they should or shouldn't pray when they're praying in tongues that you don't understand. Be courteous and considerate in everything. 
Friends, let me go over the message with you one final time, this message that I proclaimed and that you made your own, this message on which you took your stand and by which your life has been saved. I'm assuming, now, that your belief was the real thing and not a passing fancy, that you're in this for good and holding fast. The first thing I did was place before you what was placed so emphatically before me, that the Messiah died for our sins, exactly as scripture tells it, that he was buried, that he was raised from death on the third day, again exactly as scripture says, that he presented himself alive to Peter, then to his closest followers, and later to more than 500 of his followers all at the same time, most of them still around, although a few have since died, that he then spent time with James, and the rest of those he commissioned to represent him, and that he finally presented himself alive to me. It was fitting that I bring up the rear. I don't deserve to be included in that inner circle, as you well know, having spent all those early years trying my best to stamp God's church right out of existence. But because God was so gracious, so very generous, here I am. And I'm not about to let His grace go to waste. Haven't I worked hard trying to do more than any of the others? Even then, my work didn't amount to all that much. It was God giving me the work to do, God giving me the energy to do it. So whether you heard it from me or from those others, it's all the same, we spoke God's truth and you entrusted your lives. Now, let me ask you something profound yet troubling. If you became believers because you trusted the proclamation that Christ is alive, risen from the dead, how can you let people say that there is no such thing as a resurrection? If there's no resurrection, there's no living Christ. And face it, if there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors, and everything you've staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God, all these affidavits we passed on to you verifying that God raised up Christ, sheer fabrications, if there's no resurrection. If corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't, because he was indeed dead. And if Christ weren't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark, as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who died hoping in Christ and resurrection, because they're already in their graves. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up, the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. There is a nice symmetry in this, death initially came by a man, and resurrection from death came by a man. Everybody dies in Adam, everybody comes alive in Christ. But we have to wait our turn, Christ is first, then those with him at his coming, the grand consummation when, after crushing the opposition, he hands over his kingdom to God the Father. He won't let up until the last enemy is down, and the very last enemy is death. As the psalmist said, he laid them low, one and all, he walked all over them. When scripture says that, he walked all over them, it's obvious that he couldn't at the same time be walked on. When everything and everyone is finally under God's rule, the sun will step down, taking his place with everyone else, showing that God's rule is absolutely comprehensive, a perfect ending. Why do you think people offer themselves to be baptized for those already in the grave? If there's no chance of resurrection for a corpse, if God's power stops at the cemetery gates, why do we keep doing things that suggest he's going to clean the place out someday, pulling everyone up on their feet alive? And why do you think I keep risking my neck in this dangerous work? I look death in the face practically every day I live. Do you think I'd do this if I wasn't convinced of your resurrection and mine as guaranteed by the resurrected Messiah Jesus?
Do you think I was just trying to act heroic when I fought the wild beasts at Ephesus, hoping it wouldn't be the end of me? Not on your life. It's resurrection, resurrection, always resurrection, that undergirds what I do and say, the way I live. If there's no resurrection, we eat, we drink, the next day we die, and that's all there is to it. But don't fool yourselves. Don't let yourselves be poisoned by this anti-resurrection loose talk. Bad company ruins good manners. Think straight. Awaken to the holiness of life. No more playing fast and loose with resurrection facts. Ignorance of God is a luxury you can't afford in times like these. Aren't you embarrassed that you've let this kind of thing go on as long as you have? Some skeptic is sure to ask, show me how resurrection works. Give me a diagram, draw me a picture. What does this resurrection body look like? If you look at this question closely, you realize how absurd it is. There are no diagrams for this kind of thing. We do have a parallel experience in gardening. You plant a dead seed, soon there is a flourishing plant. There is no visual likeness between seed and plant. You could never guess what a tomato would look like by looking at a tomato seed. What we plant in the soil and what grows out of it don't look anything alike. The dead body that we bury in the ground and the resurrection body that comes from it will be dramatically different. You will notice that the variety of bodies is stunning. Just as there are different kinds of seeds, there are different kinds of bodies, humans, animals, birds, fish, each unprecedented in its form. You get a hint at the diversity of resurrection glory by looking at the diversity of bodies not only on earth but in the skies, sun, moon, stars, all these varieties of beauty and brightness. And we're only looking at pre-resurrection seeds, who can imagine what the resurrection plants will be like. This image of planting a dead seed and raising a live plant is a mere sketch at best, but perhaps it will help in approaching the mystery of the resurrection body, but only if you keep in mind that when we're raised, we're raised for good, alive forever. The corpse that's planted is no beauty, but when it's raised, it's glorious. Put in the ground weak, it comes up powerful. The seed sown is natural, the seed grown is supernatural, same seed, same body, but what a difference from when it goes down in physical mortality to when it is raised up in spiritual immortality. We follow this sequence in scripture, the first Adam received life, the last Adam is a life-giving spirit. Physical life comes first, then spiritual, a firm base shaped from the earth, a final completion coming out of heaven. The first man was made out of earth, and people since then are earthy, the second man was made out of heaven, and people now can be heavenly. In the same way that we've worked from our earthy origins, let's embrace our heavenly ends. I need to emphasize, friends, that our natural, earthy lives don't in themselves lead us by their very nature into the kingdom of God. Their very nature is to die, so how could they naturally end up in the life kingdom? But let me tell you something wonderful, a mystery I'll probably never fully understand. We're not all going to die, but we are all going to be changed. You hear a blast to end all blasts from a trumpet, and in the time that you look up and blink your eyes, it's over. On signal from that trumpet from heaven, the dead will be up and out of their graves, beyond the reach of death, never to die again. At the same moment and in the same way, we'll all be changed. In the resurrection scheme of things, this has to happen, everything perishable taken off the shelves and replaced by the imperishable, this mortal replaced by the immortal. Then the saying will come true, death swallowed by triumphant life. Who got the last word, oh, death? 
O oh, death, who's afraid of you now? It was sin that made death so frightening and law code guilt that gave sin its leverage, its destructive power. But now in a single victorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, death, are gone, the gift of our Master, Jesus Christ. Thank God. With all this going for us, my dear, dear friends, stand your ground. And don't hold back. Throw yourselves into the work of the Master, confident that nothing you do for Him is a waste of time or effort. Regarding the relief offering for poor Christians that is being collected, you get the same instructions I gave the churches in Galatia. Every Sunday each of you make an offering and put it in safekeeping. Be as generous as you can. When I get there you'll have it ready, and I won't have to make a special appeal. Then after I arrive, I'll write letters authorizing whomever you delegate, and send them off to Jerusalem to deliver your gift. If you think it best that I go along, I'll be glad to travel with them. I plan to visit you after passing through northern Greece. I won't be staying long there, but maybe I can stay a while with you, maybe even spend the winter. Then you could give me a good send-off, wherever I may be headed next. I don't want to just drop by in between other, primary, destinations. I want a good, long, leisurely visit. If the master agrees, we'll have it. For the present, I'm staying right here in Ephesus. A huge door of opportunity for good work has opened up here. There is also mushrooming opposition. If Timothy shows up, take good care of him. Make him feel completely at home among you. He works so hard for the Master, just as I do. Don't let anyone disparage him. After a while, send him on to me with your blessing. Tell him I'm expecting him, and any friends he has with him. About our friend Apollos, I've done my best to get him to pay you a visit, but haven't talked him into it yet. He doesn't think this is the right time. But there will be a, right time. Keep your eyes open, hold tight to your convictions, give it all you've got, be resolute, and love without stopping. Would you do me a favor, friends, and give special recognition to the family of Stephanas? You know, they were among the first converts in Greece, and they've put themselves out, serving Christians ever since then. I want you to honor and look up to people like that, companions and workers who show us how to do it, giving us something to aspire to. I want you to know how delighted I am to have Stephanas, Fortunatus, and Achaicus here with me. They partially make up for your absence. They've refreshed me by keeping me in touch with you. Be proud that you have people like this among you. The churches here in Western Asia send greetings, Bekila, Priscilla, and the church that meets in their house say hello. All the friends here say hello, pass the greetings around with holy hugs. And I, Paul, in my own handwriting, send you my regards. If anyone won't love the Master, throw him out. Make room for the Master. Our Master Jesus has his arms wide open for you. And I love all of you in the Messiah, in Jesus.